Okay, tonight I'm going to read six extracts um, from the second part of the book. There's a third to come, but it all depends on how many people will be, <laughs> will be present to listen to it next time. So the first one is karate, the beginning. I started learning karate. There was a class in the Maccabi Sports Club in the Romy Goldman Center, named after a famous local Jewish philanthropist. Judo was also practiced there. My first teacher was called Charlie Rosenfeld, a very tough third dan degree in a karate school called Shotokan after its founder, the founder of modern day karate in 1923 in Tokyo, Gichin Funakoshi Sensei. It was very tough, especially for me, the eldest in the class. The warm-ups were murder, my fitness level being abysmal and learning the techniques were mentally very challenging. Hand-eye coordination at that stage of my do or way was non-existent and I would sweat buckets by the end of every one and a half hour session. I persevered, however, and soon started seeing results. There weren't many members in the club. Tennis, football, chess and bridge were the preferred sports practiced by the Omnisport Maccabi organization. The average age was about 20, running from a minimum of 12 up to my age. There, was little more, there were little more than 10 budding karateka at the twice weekly sessions. Traditional karate is supposed to be non-contact, but accidental blows were struck. Three months after I started, I broke a younger friend's rib with probably the best punch I ever delivered over the 35 years I've been training. He never came back. I firmly believe that one has to have a mild, wild, masochistic streak to practice martial arts, as even though control and discipline are required, accidents are bound to happen. If one doesn't like pain, at least a little, I would advise any potential karateka to learn to play bowls instead. After about six months, the karate section in the Maccabi was closed. There were some problems between Charlie and the management. I immediately transferred to Kento Rio, the school of the knuckles, run by two Flemish gentlemen, Alois Minabo and Roger Juliams. As their club was in the very Jewish part of town, there were some Jewish members. Alois Sensei died only a few years after I joined. Roger is still running it, although he's close to 80 now. A classical example of what lifetime karate is. He's backed by Fred Mottelman Sensei, a friend of mine, also known as Fred Karat, an excellent karate can teacher. It is here that I was to meet the man was to be my example, mentor, and friend since then, 35 years ago. His name is Dirk Heiner Sensei. He's a couple of years younger than me, but has reached the top level of ninth dan in his more than 50 year karate journey. He used to come to teach as guest instructor once a month from his hometown in Hassel, 50 miles away. He noticed me immediately. I was, as he termed it later, the smallest, oldest, and ugliest in the club. Also, the newest member and undoubtedly the most inept of all the guys on the floor. I was also, as you could see the first time he saw me, on that fateful Thursday evening, trying very hard to keep up with what he was teaching. Six months into things, even though still smoking heavily, my physical condition had improved a lot. I had lost about six pounds and was moving much better. I only drank a beer or two at the bar of the dojo after the lessons, a typically Belgian thing. Any self-respecting dojo has a bar or a nearby watering hole for some socializing after the training sessions. I only drank whiskey on Shabbat. I had diminished my intake significantly. That night, we got to talking and he complimented me on my guts to undertake such a hard discipline. Apart from then being a well-known karateka, just having left the national team after more than 10 years, he was also an MA in sports science from Ghent University and a gym teacher in a school in Hasselt, of which he would later become a head teacher. He would also set up at the later stage in this school, the first ever sports section in the Belgium educational system. I could immediately see what an impressive person he was. He wasn't much taller than me, and then very fit and muscular with a trimmed beard. I have, in all the years I have known him, never heard him raise his voice, although one had to watch out when he lowered it. He was a terrific fighter with, most importantly, a perfect sense of timing. Traditional karate training is not only physical, 
Invariably, the youngsters who learn it are at the top of their classes at school too. It is very hard to improve the it is very good to improve the memory, sense of discipline, concentration, and focus. In our school, 26 kata or forms are practiced. These are set drills, sometimes very complicated ones, choreographed both singly and in groups to replicate what a fight might look like. Their bunkai or analysis are then studied and when applied, termed as oyo. We practice them in different directions. Omote, ura, go, and urago. Original direction, mirror image, backwards, and backwards in a mirror, uh, mirror image which essentially means that one can theoretically fight in any direction. Bruce Lee said, it is better to fight an opponent who has practiced 10,000 techniques than to fight one who has practiced the same technique 10,000 times. He was right, of course. After 35 years, I know that my muscle memory will instruct me to use those five or six techniques I have practiced the most in dangerous situations. As I had been training for six months, I was immediately allowed to go for my yellow and orange belt exam, taken under the direction of Dirk Shihan, the following month when he came to teach. First we trained, then David and I with a couple of other guys took our exam. I very much wanted to impress Dirk. At a certain moment, not being very supple but very ambitious, I screamed instead of only announcing it, Mawashi Jordan! High roundhouse kick. To succeed in such an acrobatic maneuver, I would have to go down very low. I stuck my kicking leg, leg so far back that I was literally scraping the floor with my vitals. I went much lower than the others, but they were on average 15 years younger. I somehow executed the kick without doing permanent damage to myself. I then worked with a partner on basic Kihon techniques and then executed Heian Shodan. Okay. First of the 26 chapters. <laughs> And reputedly, this the is most his book. Difficult. He wrote it. As the initiate is coming from nowhere when he first learns it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Dix nodding with a slight smile on his face. I had passed. I now was entitled to wear a colored belt. What? Well, who was David, you may well ask, with whom I took the exam? He was a giant of a boy, about six foot four, whose family ran a chain of kosher food stores. He had been training for some time in Kento Rio and was already a blue belt. In contrast to his bulk, he was extremely agile and elastic. Unlike little old me, he could kick way over his head. He could be termed as a gentle giant, unless he got upset. One evening after a training session, mainly on sidekicks, when he got to the bottom of the steps leading up to the dojo, being unmistakably Jewish with a big black kippah on his head, he was called Valayot, dirty Jew by some fool passing by in front of the building. David practiced what he had trained that evening. After a mild batter, Flemish slang for what? He kicked the poor anti-Semite across the street who was later picked up by an ambulance. The police didn't make an issue of it, being big fans of the Steinmetz chain, where they could buy at a cheap price some of the Jewish delicacies they couldn't get in an ordinary supermarket. Kento Rio also sent their best karateka to the competitions, which regularly took place all over Belgium. I was too old to compete, as the age limit was 38. A little earlier, there had been cases of serious injury and even a fatal heart attack or two. It had been decided to limit the age 38 for the experienced black belt level competitors. I and the few foolhardy guys of my level wouldn't have stood a chance, even in kata, which wasn't so dangerous, but still very strenuous. Competition today is much more regulated and even a slightly hard contact can mean disqualification. Com compared to then, competition today is for sissies. That's why MMA and UFC have become popular to the detriment of competition karate. Don't misunderstand though, using the techniques not allowed in competition, karate can be lethal and is impossible to use freely without causing very severe damage or even death to a threatening assailant. David, in a competition in Antwerp, came up against the Belgian champion of that year, a well-known, very athletic black belt. It's taking me longer to write than what ensued. David kicked him once. He went down and refused to continue fighting. David won the tournament. Today, he would have been disqualified for too hard contact. 
Unfortunately, he had to stop training a little later because of the family business. He never made black belt. He would have been a champion. Whenever I see him on my infrequent visits to Antwerp, he never fails to remind me to send regards to Dirk, whom I always go to see when I'm there. I became obsessed by karate, training at least four times a week. Thank God that Gila was busy in the evenings working on her pedagogical programs. She didn't mind my absences too much. I would come home from work at around five, eat something light, play too little with Noah, and be off at 7.30 to get to the club to train. The obsession wasn't just karate. It was about improving my health so as not to be felled by what Dr. Schilder had threatened me with and abandoned my beloved ones. Years later, Noah told me that she had felt abandoned by my not being there, there enough for her. Till today, I feel guilty about it. At that time, I didn't feel that I had a choice. I was wrong. I could have trained a little less and given my girls more time. I'm sorry. The life begins at 40. It is said that life begins at 40. It did for me. The first time we went skiing, Noah was about four. Gila, being cautious, only skied on the gentlest of the slopes with a nursery class. Not little children, but cautious adults like her. Noah took to the slopes with the kiddies class she was in, like a duck to water. Today she snowboards, which needs excellent technical ability. I went to the advanced beginners class. Here my judo training stood me in very good stead. When I rented my skis, I asked that my binding should be lighter than what my weight warranted. On the second day, I forgot how to stop on a gentle incline near our chalet. I hurtled forward in a defensive crouch and hit the snow piled up at the end of the slope. My skis stuck in a parallel line a third of their length into the pile, which was about five feet high, and I left my bindings. I flew over the pile and disappeared from the sight of my classmates. Fortunately, behind the barrier, there was a snow path, only a little lower, and the snow was very soft. I had executed a perfect right-hand forward roll. I dusted myself off with a sigh of relief and popped up from behind the barrier with a grin. The round of applause, which might have caused an avalanche from higher and more dangerous mountainous areas, was loud and sustained. I picked up my skis, and the same way paratroopers immediately jump again after a dangerous jump with wounded, I went back to the class. An aside, in the year 2000, when I was already 54, I went skiing with a couple of pals in France, including my very close friend Francois, of whom more later. The settlement between the Swiss banks and the World Jewish Congress had just happened. The Swiss had to pay the ridiculously low sum of 1 billion, 250 million US dollars to only some of the Holocaust survivors and their descendants, averaging only $2,800 per identified survivor. This they had pre previously refused to do, as they never were presented with death certificates by the families. Of course they weren't. Death certificates were not issued in the death camp crematoria, and literally everything went up in smoke. There were other legitimate ways of proving parenthood and descendants, but the Swiss refused any other means of identification, until, that is, they were forced to by international law courts. I didn't like the Swiss. I don't like the Swiss in the best of circumstances. Even though supposedly neutral in World War II, they were very much like the Swedes. They, very much like the Swedes, profited from this and did a lot of business with the Nazis, which helped support the German war effort. They are also a people with little humor, and the German dialect spoken in the German part of Switzerland, one of its four different ethnic groupings, is a contender for the ugliest language anywhere. The Swiss population, in its vast majority, was against the international court's ruling. It didn't make a deep dent in their pockets, and not wanting to get on the wrong side of the Americans, with a delay of 55 years, they agreed to pay up. My friends and I had stopped at one of the restaurants on the slope, the ones with a large semicircular platform crowded with table, tables, towering over the upcoming valley, and so well engineered that it seems to be floating on air. We all spoke Yiddish. It wasn't too difficult to understand the loud Schwitzerdeutsch conversation at the next table, and we all grew very angry at what we heard. The two tall, lank, dirty, blonde-haired men and their equally lanky lady companions were actually 
he's saying in their language and very loudly, those bloody Jews, they finally screwed us. They don't deserve our money. They should have all gone to hell where they belong. I got up slowly and in my heavy ski boots, all five foot five of me made the three steps to their table. You were cursed Catholics or Protestants or whatever. I'm a Jew and I didn't get a penny of the money you effing bastards refused to return to us. You're pretty close to the precipice, you morons. If my friends in here, even one more word from you two, you're going over the side. All this, by the way, was said in my best Süddeutsch accent. The two lanky ones went pale. Their two lady friends looked very scared. With a gesture, I motioned our heroes to stand. They were much taller than me, but they didn't. Not one more word was said by both sides. I slowly backed away to my seat, glaring at them the whole time. As soon as I sat down, they called the waiter, paid and left without a word. I was still shaking with anger as my friends calmed me down. I hate anti-Semites with a passion. Travel adventures. Travel is an inherent part of the diamond business. I hadn't liked the long flights of my younger years to and from the Far East, but they were part of my work. Dad, in his day, used to travel to Antwerp almost every week, and then, when we lived in Antwerp, back to London at almost the same frequency. He once, however, had an adventure traveling by boat, and it wasn't for business. Martin, Hert, Dad, and a few other friends had decided to take a short cruise to Israel for a boys-only holiday. They took the train to Genoa, where they would embark. Dad somehow lost his case in transit. The only thing he managed to hold on to was a small bag with his shaving gear and toiletries, as well as a new small transistor radio, which mum had bought for Mama, Bomama, her mother, who had made Aliyah with Bompapa some years before Uncle Menachem and Aunt Rachel. She lived alone now in Jerusalem. As small as she was, she was as hard as nails. I think it was her genes that Menachem inherited. Dad wasn't a big fan of his mother-in-law come aunt, and held on to that radio in sheer desperation so as not to disappoint her for fear of the tongue lashing he could expect from her if in any way he would be separated from it. She knew it was on its way. After they embarked on the Zim ship, I think it was called the Negba, for the slow, almost week-long crossing, Dad had to borrow all his clothes from his friends, from shirts down to even underwear. He would reimburse them upon arrival. He must have looked the same. Light, though. He was the smallest but not the fattest. He wore clothes that were way too big and wide for him. And upon his return, he described how he looked, having to hitch up both his outer and nether garments the whole time, as well as sometimes having to wear shirts and sweaters that were way too large. He was not only uncomfortable, but also looked like Stan Laurel wearing Oliver Hardy's clothes. There was one friend who was about dad's height, but much thinner. When he wore that fella's shirts, he looked and felt as if he was choking. It was dangerous too, as he kept losing his balance the whole time. Otherwise, the trip was quite uneventful, except that dad couldn't go swimming in the ship's pool. No one had an extra bathing suit small enough for him. When they arrived in Haifa, he had another problem. He looked very suspicious and had the bad luck to come up against an alert customs man who happened to be very tall and thin, working with a partner who was exactly the contrary, fat and small. They both wore British style office caps and Sam Brown belts. When dad wanted to go through the green exit, the tall one stopped him with an uplifted palm. Addressing him in Yiddish, he said, Wiesen an eire pekelach? Or, where are your bags? As dad was only carrying his small bag. Dad said, Ich hose verloren. I lost them. At this, the tall guy bridled and said, obviously thinking that dad had left them on the Negba, later to be smuggled with their contraband into Israel. It was in their James Bond. And what's in the James Bond? Referring to dad's bulging briefcase. Here dad made a mistake. Gunish mit Gunish, if it kicken, not knowing that electronic goods at that time were taxed on import into the country. Nothing of nothing, you wanna see? Yo, was the answer. Not worried a bit, Dad took out his toiletries and the transistor in its spanking new box. Israel, then being only a couple of days, 
of decades young, the tall and thin one continued with, Rebid, Evaisa Sidua Medina, Rabbi Jew, a very familiar way of addressing someone. Do you know that this is a country here? To which dad said, Yo, Vuzvilayid, yes, what does a Jew want? Emis Tatsun Fader Radio, Dreisik Fund, you've got to pay for the radio, 30 pounds. To which dad answered, Isn't Gefallen off Kop? The transition cost nicht das so viel. Tantamount to, have you fallen on your head? The transistor doesn't cost as much. It must be noticed that dad was thinking, it must be noted that dad was thinking pound sterling. The customs guy was quoting Israeli pounds, which were only worth about a quarter of their British counterparts. Then dad told the tall one, the small one, apparently a lower rank, hadn't said a word till then, but according to dad's friends, seemed to be having some difficulty containing himself as, at his boss's predicament. This was his excuse. This is for my own personal use. Later, I'm going to give it to the mother-in-law, a present to the country. It wasn't clear here if he meant the radio or the mother-in-law. At this point, the small and fat customs man burst into laughter. His superior turned to him and dad added, Ich sehe, as eure Kollege quält von nachers. I have vices. Aber weiß ihr, was a schwiger is? I see that your colleague is full of joy. He knows. But do you know what a mother-in-law is? At this point, the taller one said to his little colleague with his back to the now grinning and laughing crowd, Moshe, was ihr jetzt? Moshe, what do I do now? To which Moshe answered with a belly laugh, Los again, says this as a ganze schlemiel. Let him go. Can't you see he's a complete nitwit? This was very much thanks to dad's wacky looking appearance and saucy repartee. And so it came to pass that Bomberman got her transistor and the dad later on got his case back, returning all the borrowed clothes freshly laundered to their rightful owners. I had my share of travel adventures too. Remember Bupa? Once, only a very short time after Romy and I had separated, I went on a trip to Tel Aviv. I can't remember what it was for, definitely not to buy property though. By chance, I traveled with two friends. One of them was Michel, Francois's brother, who bought Polish and ran that department in the business. The other one was called Heinrich Frauenheim, a very heavy smoker whose parents had been in concentration camps. I think he was an orphan, hidden as a baby when his parents were deported. He was very well spoken. We flew via Frankfurt to Tel Aviv, did whatever we had to do, and four days later, met again on the Lufthansa Airbus back to Frankfurt. Unfortunately, there was a slight problem with the plane. The cabin crew were having difficulties with getting the rear door to lock. Michel, always somewhat impatient and with a witheringly sarcastic sense of humor, which sometimes made him slightly unpopular, but whose source I could take very well, started bothering the cabin crew whenever they rushed past. We were all together. I was at the window, Heinrich was in the middle row, not having a hard time of that being quite small and thin, and Michel, the tallest, was sitting in the aisle seat. Every time a stressed out member of the cabin crew hurried past his seat, he would ask in a loud voice, Ist alles in Ordnung mit dem Luftwaffe Flugzeug? Meaning, is everything in order with the Luftwaffe airplane? Putting a heavily exaggerated pronunciation on the Waffe part of the phrase. The Luftwaffe, namely being the name of the German Air Force in both world wars. I'm not too sure how the cabin crew appreciated these faulty towers like goings on, especially as the Germans aren't too renowned for their sense of humor. After about an hour, German Punktlichkeit or punctuality, having been found out to be seriously remiss, the crew, with a little help from some Israeli ground crew, were able to fix the door and with quite some raucous jubilation from Michel, with a lot of Luftwaffen, we finally took off direction Frankfurt, four and a half hour flight. About 45 minutes into the flight, a loud Bavarian accented announcement came through the tannoy. The Passagiere Pollack, Frauenheim und Teacher Aufstehen. With a marked rise in Teutonic intonation at the end of that order, which the passengers Pollack, Frauenheim and Teacher stand, definitely was, without any trace of bitter or please at the end of it. We all looked at each other, Michel with a disdainful look, Heinrich with a look of total fear, and I with a surprised, if not concerned one. Michel stood up slowly. 
and he stayed cowering in his seat, and I, being the only one to be able to, sprang erect with a distinct clicking of my steel-heeled shoes. From the front of the aircraft, we could see a very tall, blonde, blue-eyed, Valkyra-type air hostess, all six foot six of her, and her blonde hair brushing the cabin ceiling, making her slow but very threatening way towards us. When she reached us, she first addressed herself to Michelle, he being the closest to her and the tallest of the trio. She looked down at him and with a self-explanatory, since he had Pollack, stared him down. At least she said hair, mister, which I found somewhat encouraging. She then looked down at the smaller Heinrich, cowering and sweating in his seat, and repeated the same, but this time without the hair. Sind sie Frauenheim? Then, towering over me, she stared downwards, whilst I once again clicked my heels. She said one word. Teacher? We all shouted like Marines to the drill uh, instructor in full metal jacket, but in German, Jawohl! We couldn't very well add on sir as we were speaking German. She looked at me from the beginning, she looked at us from beginning to end, slowly yet again, and mouthed the historical phrase Essen Sie kosher? Being, do you eat kosher? Poor Heinrich Frauenheim. Two weeks later, he had a fatal heart attack in Antwerp. The doctor said it was due to his three pack a day habit. I'm convinced. It was because of that fateful Luftwaffe flight. Ireland. Yussel didn't like traveling. He is very religious and there were places he just couldn't find kosher food. He did sometimes go to India and Korea, but only for short periods, and he would take tinned food with him. It wasn't easy for him, but his customers were mainly Korean and American. Some of his suppliers were in Bombay. I, on the other hand, although also religious, would eat dairy and salads in non-Jewish restaurants so could find new markets to sell in, even if there were no Jewish meat restaurants there. That is how I started Prospect Dublin. One of the first customers I made in Dublin was Paul Shear and Jewelers, a beautiful shop in Grafton Street in the town centre, selling a very wide range of watches, beautiful jewellery and other luxury items. I met Paul and we clicked immediately. Although a tough negotiator, he was a very fair one. Over the next 10 years or so, I did a lot of business with the shop. They are still there and have been for many years. It is a very big one and the staff are well trained to give excellent service. Paul himself is a lovely fella. I have always liked the Irish since I was a baby. I made a few other customers there too and that is maybe the reason for the following incident. One day I got a call. Nicole, our secretary, couldn't understand a word except Charles. She passed the call on to me. When I answered, this is what I heard. Hello, are you Charles, teacher? I'm looking for a 15 carat stone. Just like that. When Yossel heard this, he made a hand motion signifying, not interesting, let it go. You didn't just get big orders from that, like that from people over the phone. I, however, was intrigued and answered, what's your name, sir? Where are you calling from? My name's Nat Flynn and I'm calling from Dublin. He had a really strong brogue. And how did you get my name? I asked. To this he replied, I've heard about you. You've got a very strong reputation in Dublin. The only strong reputation I knew about myself in Dublin was from when I had given a karate class in Trinity College. I had been invited by the teacher there, Steve O'Connor, of blessed memory, whom I had gone to visit and train with on one of my trips. I was a second dan then. He had asked me to show the class on the following trip the open hand techniques specific to Kaze Sensei. I had, and it had been a very successful lesson. Steve, at one point, knocking a fourth down, Malachi, five yards back with one of the techniques I demonstrated. I had a very strong reputation in the Dublin karate scene, not so much yet in the Polish diamond sector, as I hadn't even, as I hadn't even been visiting there a year yet. Yossel was shaking his head, telling me to hang up, but I persisted. That's a very large stone, sir. If we can locate one, an expensive, would you want to come to Andrew to inspect it when we find it? His answer made Yossel shake his head even more emphatically. Nope, just send me the certificate and your bank coordinates. If I like it, I'll pay cash. Things like this just didn't happen. When I hung up, Yossel said to me, don't waste your time, this is a sting. I've got to send out this shipment of $8,000. Help me with that, please. We would have made $400 on it. 
Admittedly, we sent out about 10 shipments like that a week. Still, it wasn't covering rent, salaries, and sundries. We needed something extra, some icing on the cake. I said, what if the fellow is, is legit? Let's see if we can find a stone like that. With a shrug, he also said, all right, if it makes you happy, go look for one. He didn't really believe I could find such a big stone at a moment's notice. I did, though, from my friend Ziv, a tall fellow in partnership with one of the biggest rough and manufacturing firms in the world. His passion is motorsport, a very expensive hobby, which he can afford. I saw him downstairs at lunch and said, you wouldn't believe it. I received a call from a customer. He wants to buy a 15 carat stone. You wouldn't have one by any chance, would you? Always a joker, he shook his head with regret and answered, sorry, Philip, you've missed the boat by 17 points. I've got a 14 character plus another 83 points. That's no good, is it? I looked at him as if, as if he was crazy. It's as close as I'll get today. Can I see the certificate? I phoned Jossel and told him to join us immediately. We went up to Ziv's office and he showed us the stone and the certificate. It was a beauty, a GIA eye color, VS1, meaning it had a very slight inclusion. We took a copy of the certificate and Ziv consigned the stone to me. This is where Yossel's expertise came in. He looked at the stone and immediately said, the HRD will give us an H, meaning one color better. The GIA, the main American gem laboratory, was strictly for color, but not as strict for clarity. Whilst the HRD, the main European lab, was stricter for clarity, but easier for color. If the experts, as Yossel and I, knew this, they could sometimes get a color upgrade for important stones. As it is, many customers preferred certificates from their own continent, as did the Irish. For such a large stone with a diameter of more than half an inch, it only took one day to get the new certificate. I faxed the copy of the new HRD certificate to Nate making the stone a lot more expensive than what the original certificate had been with a revised price. He phoned back the next morning. But it's not a 15 character, was his first line. To this I replied, they don't grow on trees, you know. I've checked the market. You won't find a stone like this anywhere. If you can wait, I might be able to find another stone like this in about six months. Anyway, this piece is only 17 points of 15 carats and it's got great spread. I think there's a GIA stone of about the same size around on the market, but it's an eye color and a GIA certificate. Nate's reply was, no, I don't want that. Keep 15,000 US from me as my commission and I'll take the stone. Yossel was shaking his head. We weren't going to send a stone like this to Dublin to someone we didn't know. I had already covered my back though. I had arranged the hiring of a bodyguard friend of mine, Alfredo Russo, at that time, a fifth man in the JKA with his own security firm to accompany me to Dublin in case I had to deliver the stone personally. This wasn't going to be necessary though. Nate then said, okay, I'll take it. I'll send you the money today. For two days, Yossel shook his head saying, he's a fake, we won't hear from him again. He stopped shaking his head when he, as chance would have it, answered a phone call from the bank asking us, if we had been expecting a payment of $280,000 from Dublin, sent by someone called Nate Flynn. I immediately called Nate and told him we'd send the stone and the certificate by the usual method, which was practiced worldwide. First, we'd take the stone to the diamond office where the sale would be registered and then to the bank, which would arrange shipping. Nate said, no, I want you to bring it yourself with my commission. We had been paid, so it wasn't worry about being knocked over by some Irish ruffians. I cancelled the closed security company of Alfredo. I said I'd call Nate back to confirm my arrival, arranged to pick up $15,000 in cash. In those days, one could still cross borders with large amounts of cash on one's person. Ordered a flight with Ryanair, called a few customers to tell them I was coming over with some goods. And next morning, a Wednesday, with a stone in the breast, po in the breast pocket of my shirt and the cash in my front trouser one, some goods too, off I flew. At Dublin airport, I met up with a rather strange looking guy. Nate, for that was him, was dressed in a close fitting slate gray suit with a pink shirt and a purple tie. His gray white full head of hair flowed stylishly over his collar. He looked a little like Bernie Madoff. He wasn't taller than me, 
but I looked scruffy next to him. When he saw me, as I acknowledged the card with my name he was holding up, he hurried towards me and said, Oh, you look just like I thought you would. When I heard you, I fell in love with your voice. Come, get into the car, and I'll tell you the story of the stone. You've got it, haven't you? Off we go on the way to Dublin. A little alarmed, I got into the next seat, into the seat next to him in the cream coloured Mercedes coupe that would take us on the 40 minute ride to Dublin. The story is this, said Nate. My boyfriend and I, whoops, I thought to myself, are going off to the Bahamas next Tuesday. We have to keep his wife happy, so we decided to buy the stone for her. I nodded carefully to show I was following. But we're only leaving on Tuesday. Would you like to spend a few days with me until then? I shook my head in disbelief and answered, Sorry, Nate, but I'm not of that persuasion. And even if I was, I couldn't stay. I have to go back to Antwerp on Friday. Please take me to Grafton Street. I'll manage from there. Disappointed, he asked. Give me the stone on my 15 grand, which I duly did. The man had fallen in love with my voice. Over the next few years, I did a lot of business with him. On this stone, I made the biggest profit I ever made on one transaction. We had a few expenses, but we cleared almost $65,000 on the deal. Nate made 15000 and a lot of love from his boyfriend. He was a member of Dublin's high society. I think he bred horses. He went to Ascot every year and was quite a snob. Once on another trip over there, Paul Sheeran took me to some reception after we had worked a full day together. He introduced me to Charles Hoy, the Irish Tao Sich, or Prime Minister, who asked me where I came from. I answered, I was born in London, but I live in Belgium. He answered, that's all right then. I don't like the English much, but if you live in Belgium, you're all right then. I wonder how he would have reacted if I had told him I was Jewish and not Catholic. He didn't ask. Nate was at the reception too. When he saw me, his reaction was, what are you doing here? As if to say, you shouldn't be. He lived about an hour and a half by train outside Dublin. Later, I used to go to the village he lived in, where his very exclusive shop was, and work with him there. He never again referred to our little mishap, nor did I. Once a religious this young merchant, originally from Manchester, asked me, do you know Nate Flynn? He says he knows you. Strange guy. I answered, no problem. Just let him know that you're not of his persuasion. He's good for the money. Nate died at the early age of 60 from as yet unrevealed causes. He was the same age as me. May he rest in peace. Catherine Deneuve. I have always wanted to be an actor. When I was a child, I auditioned for the hapless Robert Taylor. I was in school productions, mainly singing, and always made teachers, classmates, work colleagues, and sundry karateka split their sides laughing at my antics. I never made it big time though. I'm sure that if I would have stayed in London, I would have been discovered. One day in 1998, before starting work, I went to the bus for my daily coffee. I was surprised to see strobe lights and cameras on tripods set up in the trading hall, some of the cameras being focused on the purchasing table. I went into the restaurant thinking that a documentary about the trade was going to be filmed. Imagine my surprise when I saw at one of the tables, none other than the instantly recognizable famous French film star Catherine Deneuve. Already in her mid fifties, a few years older than me, she was stunningly beautiful. She is one of those women who, even in old age, remain so. She was having breakfast with a few people, amongst whom an evidently very chuffed-looking Arthur Zeller and another very chic-looking lady, whom I was later to find out, was the director of the film I was going to star in. Nicole Garcia, another French actor, and as in this case, director too, I don't know why. Hello? Everything all right? Ah. Um, Nicole Garcia, another French actress, and as in this case, director too. I don't know why, but Arthur, not a particularly good friend of mine, being more of a Romy type, called me over and introduced me, saying without an even by your leave, this is Charles' teacher. He'd be an ideal extra for today's shoot. At this, Nicole Garcia said to me, Vous parlez le français et l'anglais aussi? You speak English and French too? I answered in the affirmative, saying, 
I was born in London. She looked me up and down, then said in French, you no, no, someone needs to, um, to, needs to mute. I think it's the old birds. Someone needs to get a message to them. He'll do. We paid 2,500 Belgian francs for a day's work. Is that all right for you? It wasn't much compared to what I just earned in Dublin a couple of weeks earlier, but I assented as I didn't have much to do that day and was sure that Jostel would be able to hold the fort without me. I went to the phones, called him to tell him what was going on, and he answered with a laugh. Now we've got a star in the firm too. The names of our firm were King Diamonds and the Star of Antwerp. This one had been acquired after my entry into the firm. The filming started at about 10 o'clock and would last till the late evening. Anyone who has seen Place Vendôme, the name of the film referring to the square in Paris, where many exclusive jewellery stores are located, would have seen my stellar performance. Catherine Deneuve's role was that of the widow of a jeweller who had committed suicide because of some difficulties encountered, encountered due to his involvement with criminals. She finds some of his valuable stock and sets out to sell them, even though this will eventually get her into dire straits too. In the scene being filmed that day, she visits the Antwerp Diamond Bros to find out more about her husband's activities and to see if she can somehow unload the goods. I was given a one-liner first, effectively saying in my Belgian accent in French to a fellow extra who only had to nod in reply, see that woman at the end of the table? She looks like a customer. 14 historical words, much longer than the only six words given to Cosmo Kramer in a now long forgotten Woody Allen film and for which he was fired. These pretzels are making me thirsty. I did so well that Nicole Garcia decided to use me in a much longer sequence. Here I would be offering on a 10 carat flawless emerald cut stone. Unfortunately, my co-star, a much older man and the real owner of the gem, who spoke English with a thick German accent, was so unphotogenic and acted so badly that we both ended up on the cutting floor. Strangely enough, I was sure that if Romy had been my co thespian our performance would have been of prize-winning quality. Unfortunately, he was nowhere to be found. During breaks in filming, I met and chatted with Catherine Deneuve. She was an absolutely charming person who complimented me on my performance. I don't know if I left a lasting impression on her, but she definitely did on me. Midlife crises. Noah, now a teenager, was also doing well. At school, she was in the top mathematics stream without having any problems. She was popular in her class, sometimes representing it if there were issues with the teaching staff, which although very rare, did occur. She was a good negotiator, which would stand her in good stead in her later career choices. She was also a chip of her grandfather's block as far as raw talent went. I remember her singing Boaz Sharabi's song, Halavai, if only, at the inauguration of a new street, the Maccabi Land, named after the Maccabi Sports Organization and adjacent to its clubhouse and tennis courts in Wilreich, an Antwerp suburb. She also sang another song by the same singer at a fundraiser for the school, where a well-known Antwerp diamond dealer donated the princely sum of $6,000 to hear her sing La Tête. She was so much in demand that at another school function, she was put on a program to sing Man Yiddishe Mama, a very popular song translated into many languages and a real tearjerker. She was a huge hit. I thought that she was singing it especially for Gila, who reacted in the age old way. Even I, way back in the hall and not known for showing much emotion, had to wipe a couple of tears from my cheeks. As optimistic, or as I term myself pessimistically optimistic as I am, I had not one, but two midlife crises. One was back when I was 40, and the second when I was 50. I pra practically embedded myself in Dick's dojo in Hassel the first time, and I'm still grateful to him for his support. That's also the time I had an accident with the Audi, about seven years after the one with the 620i, again with the same results as the first time. I slid on an oil patch, again entailing about 4,000 euros in damage. The insurance yet again paid up when I told them I'd been doing 75 when I'd been doing 110. Funnily enough, 
The six months that it took to extract myself from the earlier crisis happened at one of the best periods in my life. I started working with Romy, as well as starting my way in karate. Sometimes when things are going well, one just doesn't recognize it. The second one, just before Romy and I split up, preceded a bit of a burnout that was diagnosed as such by Dr. Schilder. My type 2 diabetes discovered about then might have had something to do with these crises, but I'm convinced that my move over to karate must have preempted a much worse disease, namely diabetes itself, which is much worse than the type 2 kind. Avraham and Leon were both good tennis players when they were younger. Leon used to laugh a little at Avraham's style, which one could term as mincingly efficient. His, servant, his service action was very pretty, but efficient enough, and his other techniques were also nice to watch. Leon played a rougher game, but also would win his matches. Before I started karate, I also tried tennis. I found myself an old Hungarian teacher and trained with him for about three months before I moved on to greener pastures. My fore and backhand were reasonably proficient, and he complimented me a lot on the service action he had taught me. Unfortunately, there was one major problem. When serving, I practiced all, I practically always missed the ball on its way down. Alternatively, in the few cases I did hit it, I either netted it or smashed it out of the confines of the court. Half the time, we were outside it looking for errant balls. At that time, I had absolutely no hand-eye coordination. In learning karate, I improved my coordination and also sense of direction. Once during a group kata session, I went the wrong way, 180 degrees away from the rest of the group, and inflicted an accidental black eye on a young Finnish karateka called Antti Kovalainen, who took it well, saying, You went the wrong way, Charlie. Don't do it again. Everybody forgave me, as I did everybody. Forgiving is a major component of traditional martial arts. Thank you very much, everybody. If there are any questions, I'm willing to uh, answer them. Is that it? Well done, Philip. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Very, thank you very much, Philip. Very interesting. I'm glad. <laughs> thank you. There were definitely some laugh out loud moments in there. Thanks. We of course. Need a, a good laugh every so often. Of course. There you, are, you, you understand Yiddish, don't you, Faye? Of course I do. That was uh, the but best. There you are then. Yeah, that yeah. was the best. The, your, father's, <laughs> your father's entry to Israel was the funniest of all. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but um, 